And without any delay whatsoever, I'd like to hand you over to your host for the afternoon, Mary Louise O'Donnell. Thank, Thank you. you. very much for inviting me to Westport, where I hope to come and live very soon in the, in the, in the next year. Um, I, it's wonderful, thank you. thank you. It's wonderful to know what you do on a Saturday afternoon. Tea and cakes and homemade biscuits and books and people and chat and talk. I mean, it's just perfect. You know, I've always considered Westport to be, as I do Mayo generally, but Westport to be the seat and the home of great artists, great writers, great theatre people and, and um, visual artists. And I think on behalf of anybody in the audience today who is visiting us from France or has relatives in France or who has family in France or has, who has had the privilege of being in the great city in Paris, I would like on behalf of us all just to offer our absolute condolence on the profound grief and bereavement that the French people will have to experience on their, on their awful murders uh, last night. So I just thought that we should do that because one of the things about the arts and about writers um, is that they are so above politics, you know, and that we can learn so much, visual artists, musicians, um, and they can, they can actually propel how, who we are as real human beings, expressive human beings, into another world, and a world that politics can pull us back into. So I, I just wanted to say that. The second thing I'd like to say is that it's a great place to come with Vincent now for an affair. River. <laughs> 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 Coming down, I thought Tulsk might be a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> you might be seen in Tulsk. Nothing yeah. <laughs> wrong with Tulsk, but you could go into Tulsk yeah. and never come out. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody would be bothered to look. And there you go. Um, I also think that today is great um, because uh, the Abbey Theatre. Mm? And Fiach Machanil, my friend Senator Machanil, who is a great guy, you had a little bit wrong, with ten plays and nine of them yeah. written by men and only one by a woman. It just shows you the power of social media as it did last night. Yeah. To have women galvanize and said, hold on here. You know, uh, we need women writers here, we need women dialogues, we need women dra dramatics here. This is what we need. Uh, we just don't want to be the housekeeper in the play. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. And there are great women writers and they're not getting the platform. And all of the women were right about that. So today is wonderful to be here uh, and have two very young, I'm only 37 now, so they're, <laughs> so they're very, very, very young writers here with us this afternoon. Now, first of all, let me introduce you to Louise O'Neill. Now, Louise O'Neill is from Clonakilty in County Cork, and she's a prize-winning author. And she studied at Trinity, she studied English, and then she went off to work in the Outstanding LA magazine in America. She has, I have read two of her books, Only Ever Yours, uh, and Asking For It. And they're very interesting books because they're written for and about a young audience. If I, um, I, I don't want to prep, uh, pre-see your book at all because I'd like you to tell us th about them yourself. But for those of you who haven't read, Only Ever Yours is about a kind of a school, to put school doll-like women. Young girls <laughs> who go to a kind of a boarding school where they learn how to be beautiful, never fat, to end up as either concubines, chastities, or submissive. And, and, and women who just have children. Now, it might be that's a very, very bad paraphrase, but it's a very interesting take on a lot of things about the, the culture and young, young girls and young women and the kind of culture that are being reared around in relation to television and video. The second book is called Asking For It, which is about a rape of an 18 year old. But it's, it's a, a lot more, and the, those involved, and the evolving of the rape and what happens after it. And it is, they are both magnificently written, brilliantly written. And I'm, it's a real privilege to meet you, because I have followed your career. The second writer today is Neve Boyce. And Neve is from Athai in County Kildare and lives in Ballylinham. And she has been at the Hennessy Award in 2012, New Irish Writer. And she's a new, she was a newcomer of the year in 2013. Now, they're both prize winning. 
and, and they also are up for a lot of awards. She's also a poet, and she has written a poem called Kitty, which I think is absolutely magnificent. And I, she's written a lot of poems, but this has got a, I think, got an award for this. Didn't you? Yeah. And she's going to recite that later. And she's also a short story writer, and she has a new novel coming up. But her novel is called The Herbalist. I don't know whether you've read it or not, but it is about a herbalist, a man of magic from the Orient, swarthy and magnificent with rings, who comes to a town in 1939, and he just takes over as a conjurer, but he's also other things as well. For those who haven't read it, you don't want to give the story away. So I thought that we'd do first. The other thing to tell you is that after, I'm just going to ask questions, I'm a little nervous about it, because I'm usually at the other side of the camera, um, on the other side of the microphone. But I was going to ask them to read a moment, just a small moment from their book, whatever one they want, and then I was going to ask some general questions about their and their lives and why, where it all came from. And then I was going to open it to the floor. And I thought it would be very interesting, because I know there are people here, I see Eleanor Valley Dunlop here, a great colleague of mine, and there might be people rising out of the themes of the books that might like to talk or ask about writing or whatever. Or, or even promote your own work, uh, whatever. So we'll start with maybe any of you might just uh, uh, let the audience hear maybe a sip, a, a half a minute or a minute on, on the okay. herbalist. And you can read your poem maybe later. Okay, all right. Um, well, the piece I'm going to read is, is from the end of the book, but it, it, when I wrote it first, it was at the beginning. So it, it's, um, my book was inspired by something I read years and years ago when I was 19. Um, when I was indexing old newspapers, I came across many articles, but one of them was a very short article, it was only a sentence, and it was, um, it was a local paper, so it was my hometown, this book is based in my hometown, and it had said, um, an Indian man arrested for an offence against a girl, and I was, I was 19 at the time, I didn't write, but it never <coughs> left me, you know, and I wasn't aware that I remembered it until years and years later. But I remember when I when I read that, I, I, I thought, I wonder who he's a scapegoat for, because it just felt, you know, well, first of all, what was he doing here in in, in the 1930s in his high? Um, so uh, that that small article, years later, when I when I began to write, uh, turned into a book. It started as a story, and it got longer. And so the piece I'm going to read now um, references that that article, but it, but at this. And it's spoken, it's from the point of view of a woman called Aggie who lives on a, a riverboat. And um, so she's just going to read out the article and then I'll read the rest. Okay. The, the, uh, the extract is probably going to be shorter than my <laughs> introduction to it. Um, charge against herbalist. Don Vikram Fernandez, a middle aged coloured man with an address in Black Walk, will appear in court on Friday, the 1st of September, charged with an offence against the girl. Does that ring any bells for you? It's a, tour, it's a poor article. Very little end of my thumb. Middle-aged. You wouldn't like that. No, sorry, you wouldn't. You'd miss it if you weren't looking for it. But there were plenty looking for it. Plenty with an interest. And not who you'd expect. Go away out here only a gossip. That's what was said to me. Even when it was there in black and white, hidden amongst those other incordy events. Burns top trolls to dangled for Robin the plank. Young Greenlee caught for no light in his bloody bicycle. And that lone sentence in memory of you, Rose. You wouldn't know it, but it's my story. You won't find me in the colleges. You won't find me in the newsprint. You'll find me in the gaps, the commas, the full stops, the small dark places where one thing led to another. I was afraid to speak. But now I'm not, for who hurt me now? I'm past that, past touch. Isn't that right, Aggie? Shh, that's enough. See how it rains and rains. See how the river breaks its banks. As I speak, mothers are warning their daughters to never, ever go near a strange land and to always stay away from that lane. Bad things happen in that lane. And now it's haunted by the ghost of an unfortunate girl. Oh yes, they say, there's a crack in the centre of town where young girls sit down and amongst themselves, the women talk of matters they'll never tell their children, their husbands, late night confessions. He performed on menstrual acts for a spell on my daughter. My sister, my neighbour, and on me, on me, on me. Dr. Sin, with his herbs, lotions and potions, creeps into their dreams. And what, they wonder, tiptoeing downstairs to their cupboards to select one of his brown glass bottles and hold it up. Just what, they wonder, really swims therein. What sort of herbs? What breed of medicine? Ladies, the herbs are his fingertips, his quite lips, his dry hands, cooling you down, cooling you down. 
and what will you do without them? Mm. He's very exotic, isn't he? <laughs> Pull you in. And it reminds me of the of the sound of the leaves there so when you were reading it, the way he would pull pull you into to his lotions and potions. Right, Louise, you're yep. going to read something. Go yes, do. Um, yeah, so this is my second novel, I'm Asking For It, and it's set in a small town in West Cork, not called Clonakilty. Um, it's called um, Ballin' a Tomb, and it's about an 18-year-old girl called Emma O'Donovan, and Emma is beautiful, intelligent, popular, she has the world at her feet. And then one night she goes to a party, she gets drunk and she passes out, and when she wakes up the next day, she's been thrown on the front porch of her house, and she has no recollection of how she got there. And it's only when pictures start to emerge on social media that she can piece together what's happened to her the night before. Um, so I'm going to read you an extract. This is just before. This is when she's at the party and she's um, with her friend Jamie. After one violent retch that sounds like it might burst the lining of her stomach, Jamie wipes her mouth, then gets to her feet unsteadily, holding on to the toilet for balance. Do you need help? She bends over the sink, splashing her face with water. Standing up straight, she looks at me in the mirror. Her face is blotchy, her eyeliner smeared halfway down her cheeks. What do you care? Jamie, you said it would be better. Jamie, I, it's not better, Emma. It's not better. Her breath is rasping in her throat. You said, you said. She can barely get the words out through her tears. She looks such a mess. And there must be something wrong with me because I know I should feel sorry for her, but all I feel is disgust. Look at yourself, I want to tell her. You're ruining your makeup. Do you even care? I tried to shush her, telling her to come on, Jay, you need to calm down. This isn't the right place for this. But she ignores me, sitting on the toilet seat, her head in between her knees, so all I can hear through her wails is, you said, you said that if I, Dylan, you told me to. Come on, Jamie, stop it. You told me. It's happened to loads of people. It happens all the time. You wake up the next morning and you regret it or you don't remember what happened exactly. But it's easier not to make a fuss. But that's not how it happened. She stares up at me. I told you what happened, but I wasn't there with you, Jamie, was I? How am I supposed to know what really happened? But I told you, I didn't want, I didn't want to. You didn't say no. I crouched down in front of her, placing my hands on her shoulders. You told me, you didn't say no. But she shrugs my hands off her and looks at me with such despair that my skin crawls. I didn't say yes, either. <laughs> Asking for it is a very controversial book. And I think it should be read by every, I would say, 16-year-old to 30-year-old woman in an island today, but we'll come to that in a second. Can I just ask you generally, the two of you, where uh, your writing comes from? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Start off with an easy question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's crept up on me. I didn't start writing until I was 37. So, um, it's, it, I, I loved books. I absolutely adored books. Um, I would read anything, uh, you know, I couldn't be without a book at any point in time because it wasn't something that I was in the middle of. And, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because I just went to a workshop, with, um, I was, it was a couple of years ago and I went to a workshop because I wanted to do something in the evening and it could have been Macrami or you know, <laughs> Chinese or, you know, but it, was, it happened to be short stories and I just got hooked then and I couldn't stop writing. So maybe it was there all the time, but I wonder, it, it often interests me why I, I, even though I love writing and love writing, well, I wrote journals, mm. that it never occurred to me that I could be 
I could write books mm. if I would want to. It never, just never occurred to me. It was one of those things you maybe I felt other people did, or you know, I don't know. But I think that has something to do with why it took so long. And it might not have happened. I don't, you know, it might never have happened. I don't know. Mm. But um, from that minute onwards, I just couldn't. From what minute onwards? From from the minute that I went to the short, that short story workshop. Mm -hmm. And we, I wrote a small story. I thought it was a story. It was actually very so small. It probably wasn't. But once I finished that, I just couldn't say. It, it felt like I'd started. I was very surprised at what I was writing. Because I, if you'd asked me what would you be writing, I thought, Temporary and the edge of the you know, and at least the second stories were from so far back, and I think they're my grandmother's stories, I think they're my mother's. That generation, it does feel like it's no, it's no coincidence that, like, mm -hmm. my book is based in the town I grew up in, this, these voices, they're, they're ones I heard as I was a child. Um, people, I, I remember doing readings and people say, well, how, how did you know what it was like, your, your certain age? But I was reared by women who were, who were of, who grew up in the time of in the thirties, and I also know people, um, older people who came to the launch who, who knew the harpist. The original, the, the book is based on a on a real person, so he knew that tale. I, was, I think that story came up from mm -hmm. from you know. I think it'll be different with everything I write, you know. So, um, and I like the idea of, of it being. I love Margaret Atwood. I love. The idea that there's not going to be one strain of books or one strain that's going to come, writing is just going to come from one place. But with this particular book, I felt it came from all the echoes yeah, of all the people yeah, around you. Yeah, I wrote with complete confidence, even though I and I did my research afterwards because it felt like the voices were coming through, mm. um, particularly with, with, with uh, character Aggie. I felt like she was the voice of the book, even though she's actually only in it. She, yeah. she, she flows through it. Yes. And I felt the river was, was the voice of the book. Really. What about yourself, please? Um, well, when I was a child and a teenager, I wanted to be an actress. Um, and so it was only when I, I went to Trinity to study English literature. And it was when I was there, I think I decided that writing was something that I would maybe like to do. But then I took a bit of a round about way of getting there because when I was 25 as you said I moved to New York um, to work for the senior style director of Elle magazine um, and while I was there I suppose you know working within an industry that's so obsessed with how women look and the commodification of the female body um, I had this idea for a story set in a boarding school in which in a world in which women were no longer able to have daughters they could have sons but they couldn't have daughters so faced with the extinction of the human race, these schools were set up in which girls were genetically modified, bred for their beauty, and then trained to be subservient to men. Um, that's always a mouthful. You only say that to like every man in like a ten mile radius starts like backing away. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so I, I moved home. Um, and I think it was my twenty sixth birthday. Um, my parents gave me a laptop, and my mom was like, this is for your novel. And I was like, oh shit, they actually expect me to write this thing. <laughs> um, and about a week later, I just sat down, and it's so funny, because you know, when I talk to other authors, um, they're like, oh, I've been writing you know, stories, and you know, I I've attempted 20 other novels, and it wasn't like that for me. You know, this book, sometimes it felt like when I was editing it, there was huge passages of the book that I couldn't even remember writing. Um, it just felt like I was channeling it, like it just came through me rather than from me. And I just, Everything has just my entire career so far. Anyway, it's just flowed with such ease. It's just been very so. Amazing. So it's inextricably linked to both of you. Like it's inextricably linked in an echo way to you, Neve. You of of stories of aunts and uncles or old people around the town, and inextricably linked to you. Would that have anything to do with Elle magazine and the images of women and the world you were living in? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And also, you know, I went to an all girls convent school from the age of four to eighteen, and you know that sort of. Very competitive, um, single sex dynamic um, where girls are just socialized to compete with each other um, and not to be the most intelligent or the most successful or the most ambitious, but who's the thinnest, who's the prettiest, and who can attract the most male attention. But that's an um, odd thing to say in 2000 and whatever. The well, 2000s, I mean, I went there, no, whatever. The, no, I agree. The, it is an odd thing to say. I mean, I read yeah. Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale when I was 15, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, wow, this book is the same age as I am and it still feels so relevant. And at 30, I reread it, and I was like, wow, this book is the same age as me, and it still feels so relevant. So I, I, I wouldn't say, unfortunately, things, you know, I mean, I hope things are changing, but... But you don't see that at all. Um, I get the impression you feel they're attracting. Um, a little for women. bit. A little bit, yeah. Um, I think that does, that tends to happen. Um, anytime that women 
achieve more social or political power, there does seem, seem to be a backlash um, against that, where in order to maintain the status quo, women are trying to sort of put in their place. And I think the beauty myth and this pressure on young women to conform to a certain idea of physical attractiveness definitely doesn't help. I can say about that. I think it's, um, it's, it's particularly sad is because it's women who perpetrate. Yeah. That's why it's so strong. It's women. It's not really, you know, it, 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 you know, it allows, I know there's the systems, the institutions, I do believe there's a patriarchy, of course I believe that, mm. but I believe the reason it still hasn't gone away is just because it's women who are, <coughs> and like you were saying, that divide and conquer, yes. this competitiveness, um, this, you know, so the, the pack mentality when someone gets successful, they've left the group and they need to be, yeah. you know, there's certain, uh, but I think it is, yeah, I think the, you know, a lot of women, um, because bread, I suppose. Yeah. So I might you get the impression then, uh, because both of your books, one in the more in the modern and the other, as uh, say, set in the late thirties, but they're always uh, the uh, surround women and the stories of women, and in your case, of women trying to get out, you know, yeah. of a, a very dull society and stay in the shop for the rest of your life, or yeah. be half reared because mother wasn't there or mammy was died or dad yeah. was drunk or whatever. And the most freedom was the, the, the person who had the most freedom was the person who was not respectable. I think respectability is, is, yeah. is so constraining for women, this notion, of, in, and in those days. So the person who actually has the freedom, I'm not saying she has a nice life, but the person who has the freedom is the person who is completely outside of that, who's the prostitute who lives in a, on a riverboat because what has she got to lose, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But people who have some respectability, I and mean, this is what, this is why people, um, you know, why people kind of went along with this, you can't say church, church, family, society, it's all, it was all internalised, you know, so, um, yeah, I think, I, 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 was, um, I just think she had the freedom, the certain kind of freedom to say, do what she wanted, in, in that, in that society, you know, like, things have changed, but the year my book came out, so that you died, um, and so little has changed, which, the, the illusion of progress, is, is interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what's interesting about yeah. a reading a book like yours, though, mm -hmm. is like you see how women were policed in 1939 and how their sexuality was policed, and then something like Slain Girl happens, or you know, the Magnus yeah. Girl case, and you see how much of the blame is always put on the woman, that you know, they're expected to mm -hmm. adhere to a higher moral standard. You know, boys will just be boys, which is just so insulting to men as well. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's, I think it's that disparity between how we see and view female and male sexuality. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, I, has I guess changed. how much has changed, you know? So you see Irish women now. I'm getting very depressed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really genuinely. I mean, I I hear what you're saying, I, I, but, but do you really see that that we have? Because I, I think that the, the point about respectability is it, because one that that once that door opens, sometimes a sense of joy or wonder or a sense of the freedom of the unleashed first unleashed woman after wolves yeah. and loses out. Do you think that women are are uh, because I think we'd all get the impression now that young people are very liberal and very liberated and it's a good place to live and very vocal and they can stand up and... There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, you're talking about as a teenager, you're looking um, at going to a future where your male peers are going to make 70, you know, you're going to make 70 cents um, to their euro for every, um, you know, for every euro that they make for doing the exact same job. Um, and, you know, we still don't have safe legal abortion in this country. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. I, I, and I do think the way men and women are judged is very different. You know, you read all these articles, how can women have it all? Oh, you never see anything with like, how can men have it all? Or <laughs> how you just have you know, a child, how are you back to work? Well, what do you mean by have no, it all? Because, but that's the pressure. It's like you have to be um, a perfect mother, you have to be a perfect cook, you have to make sure that your husband is sexually satisfied at all times. And <laughs> it's like, it's just all this stuff. And I'm just like, I can't be bothered about it. Yeah. Just gonna stay single. But it's interesting. <laughs> Women are always seen in relation to someone else, never yeah. for who they are themselves. So if, if you know, even within the media, and I'm not saying this, this is, when I say always, it's not like every person I meet, there's lots of great women, I have lots of great friends, there's lots of people who are, you know, pro-women and, and um, have sympathy for the women, women in the past, women in my book, but uh, every time I, um, when my book came out, every time I was referred to in the articles, it was in relation to someone else, it was called The Mom, who wrote it by Sarah. You know, um, I'm a writer, you know, and I was, I was asked, even like years after um, 
the Late Late Show and Ryan Fanuka and I was we were asked, John Boland asked us um, what it was like to how do we manage writing with children, you know? A male author would never be asked. I'd never be asked that, you know. Well is that not in one way a kind of a compliment? And let's throw that on its head. Yeah. Like, is it not a kind of a compliment to ask her, how do you do this? Are you know no, but and it, rare to it's her the children? It's the expectation that the um, parenting of the child will automatically fall on the mother's mother. Which is true, but that's not the way it should be. I mean, marriage is supposed to be a 50 50 partnership, therefore, having children should be 50 50. So, why would a but male author never be asked how having children affects part of it? When you go somewhere in your professional capacity, like, let's say, you know, to, you know which, which you are doing, and then you're asked, like, how you know, <coughs> How do you manage to wash all of them? You know, or how do you manage? But well, what on earth has that got to do with asking? Ask the guy, you know. Well, maybe he's asked by men because they can't multitask and they want to find out how to do it. No, we won't go into that. It's very, it can be funny and it's just, it can be sometimes amusing. But then when you see it has knock on effects in terms of being taken. Seriously, mm -hmm. as a, as a person uh, who does the job you do, has not you know um, knock on effects then of in terms of um, where you you know how you're perceived and you can see it quite common you know the the, the, the greats the Irish the Irish greats the, mm -hmm. the, the, whose literature that's another interesting one yeah. you know the notion this this notion that's kind of gone out chick later mm -hmm. when women write no matter what they write about. For, for 10 years it seemed it was going to be slapped between the yeah. covers that said, don't worry, we don't breathe, yeah. you know? And that whole thing, that has gone, because I remember seeing a, a, a documentary made by RTE about the, the phenomena of chiclet, about women reading these books and writing these books. Why was it a phenomena? Women mm -hmm. have always written more than, than men. They've always read mm -hmm. more than men. Mm -hmm. They buy, if, if, if we stop going to the theatre, it'd be empty. Mm -hmm. You know, there'd be no one there behind the scenes. There'd be no one, um, so it's, it's acting like it was a, some, an aberration, like, look at this, they're successful, so let's make it into something soft and pink. Yeah. But it's not, we're, they were dynamic and we, you know, yeah. Irish women writers for that generation were brilliant at what they mm. were doing. Mm. And it was made, it's, you know, mm. like, 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 like your book now, I bet you that I would see a very domestic tale. It was yeah, be written by a man. Hold on, hold on. Speak to the audience. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was just saying, <laughs> this book. Where you know, I think it would probably be perceived that it was just a very domestic tale because it's written written by a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was was it that I think it was a few months ago. This um, woman called Catherine, I think her surname was Alice. She was in the UK and she started sending out her manuscript, and she got rejections all around. So then she started sending out the exact same manuscript, the exact same covering letter, and she called herself George. And she was um, it was accepted I think like ten or eleven times. So I mean you know that's tangible proof. Of what we're talking about here, and it's true because when 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 the story is about a young boy going out in the world, and if the young boy met the herbalist and had a great old time with him, and it changed his life, it would be a universal story, coming of age story. Yeah. Well, oh, hold on a minute now, the two of you. You're sitting here. You're sitting here, and we're all buying your books, and you have prizes, and you've been on television and radio, and we're delighted and very privileged to be in your company. So, so we must be doing something right in this country in relation to your work. It can't be. All all, all that bad. All no, time. I feel I feel very lucky, but I also know that the topics that I'm writing about are very challenging. Um, so I think I probably I probably get respect because of that. Because if you look at some at someone like Marion Keys, who's a, a very good friend of mine, and she's amazing at what she does. And it, you know, she's talking about domestic violence, um, rape, uh, alcoholism, addiction, um, and you know, a depression, and it gets a pink cover on the front, and it's called Chiclet. And then you've got someone like Nick Hornby. Who's also writing about maybe male concerns and you know male insecurities, and then it's great literature and it's you know or David Nichols and it's nominated yeah. for the oh, no, but you have to. You'd, I mean, in praise of you here, your book is like um, a play. It's like a dramatist dialogue from word go uh, about the build of this character and the characters around and the parents, and it builds and builds and builds to the actual rape, which is a, a, it's a multiple rape, really, of the young girl who is quite drugged at the time. And, and then the whole, the whole collapse of the family, you know, and the collapse of everybody around, and, and then what to do about whether to pursue it, because she didn't say yes, the very thing you do. So you do, you are very stark. So I think 
it, 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 hit, it hit a lot of things very quickly and very hard uh, uh, in, in your, so I, I think that there's not really a comparison, I'm not, I'm not sure you're trying to make one, but I think that's, that's a tough and a different, physical and visceral, to the point where I, you, you, you kind of re, you, you recoil back, and because it's done, everybody should read it, because it's done in kind of dialogue, the, the, you know, the punch and pulse of dialogue, <coughs> and she never lets you away. You don't go away in, in a description or a moment where you get to calm. You're not allowed, except when she's speaking. You know, she's in her cell phone. So, uh, uh, tell me about where that was that difficult to write. It was um, from because, as I said, only every yours just seemed to flow from the very beginning. Um, and asking for it because um, it's set in the real world, and I wanted it to be really authentic. Um, I used to do a lot of research, so I went to the rape crisis centre in Cork and spoke to survivors of sexual assault. Um, I read a lot of. Um, non-fiction and first-person accounts and memoirs of people who have been um, raped um, and you know spoke to barristers so there was a lot of research that it went into it um, and also so it was harrowing and because of my background um, in theatre because that was something that I wanted to do that's kind of how I approach writing as well and to take on the character and really sort of, kind of I think become nearly obsessed with that world and really just consumed by it, um, and that did make it very difficult to have had nightmares. It, the first draft took six months, and I had nightmares pretty much every night about being raped. Um, and then I think what made it even more disturbing was um, I had been sexually assaulted when I was 19. I had to tell my parents about that because I knew I was going to come up with interviews, so that was a really harrowing conversation to have. But then as soon as I started talking about this and to saying about what the book was going to be like, it was like every woman that I knew finally felt like she had permission to say, this happened to me when I was 17, this happened to me when I was 18. I just didn't know how to say no, he went too far, I asked him to stop, he didn't stop, I was too drunk, I, I woke up and he was having sex with me. It just, it was actually really terrifying because I felt like I'd had this really close friendship with all of these women and we had never discussed this before because there's such a shame and stigma attached to it where, and every single person said, well, I was drinking, and you know, I did go back to his, and I was wearing a really short skirt, and you know, it, it, you know, and the one line that kept coming up was, it wasn't rape, but it wasn't right. So it just felt like I was like, wow, this is nearly like an epidemic, and I didn't even realize because I suppose maybe there is that shame and stigma attached that you think this is my fault, and I don't want to share this story with anyone. Um, and I suppose that's the power of telling your stories is that other people feel like they can share theirs with you as well, and there is a power in that, I think. So it was a well for you. This yeah. was a well for you. Mm -hmm. And did you find that? Um, did you find you got you got some kind of, you know, uh, peace from the book? I mean, the book came from other people's stories as well. Yeah. Obviously, with all the research you did, and the fact that this is kind of a, it's a moment in our atmosphere all the time. Yeah. So when it's on, I, I I constantly give out all the time about. You know the language of sexuality it's now creeped into that bloody x factor you know which families like to enjoy but now we have dancers who are actually assimilating uh, sex you know dancing with the song we have videos we have advertising we have marketing we have and we've been a company in the north side of the city saying do you want to get laid on the south side <coughs> we're going to come down and put your flooring in it is funny but it, but it, there is a whole sexuality of language, of comedy, of marketing, of advertising, that it's in our ether and, and, the, and becomes more boundaryless. But I think the confusing thing about that, particularly for women and particularly for young women, yeah. is it is this hypersexualization, and you are bombarded with these images of very sexy and sort of sexy dressed women. You get this message in order to be acceptable, in order to be loved in order to be accepted, which is all any of us ever want. I have to dress like this and I have to act like this. But then there's this really the, you know, conflicting message where it's actually, as a woman, if you're actually sexual, as in if you actually you know, like enjoy sex or you know, you know, take pleasure in your own sexuality, then that's something that's really frowned upon and that's nearly seen as dysfunctional in a way that male sexuality is, is seen as being normal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why it's so confusing, where you see, for let's say if you're a young girl and you're looking and you're like, okay, these, you know, these pop stars and you know, they're dressed in this really sexual manner, but then look at something like Slaying Girl and see how she's vilified in comparison to the boys that were involved for her sexuality. So I think that's very confusing, that's sort of conflicting um, messages. Do you want to speak on this? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so, so are you saying then that Ireland is really a good place? 
in a, in a, I don't mean in a bad way, but a, a good place to be a young writer. That it's not that it is giving you a lot of well and a lot of things to write about, and it is finding a place for you. Yeah, I was very surprised. You know, I do, you don't think about the writing world. You don't think about readers. Um, you just write the book. And so I was very surprised because my book was very dark. And I wrote it for myself. And I wrote it in the mornings. And I wrote it longhand. And I wrote it for myself. And um, I, I really didn't think that it would ever... I, I did know it was going to be an awful because it's, I wanted to tell the story and it was there. But I was very surprised at how it was received and that people actually liked it. And I mean, you know, and that because it was dark, and I often thought, oh, I, I really, I used to think that if, if publishers were involved at that stage, they'd say, oh, lighten it up, or would you make some of them more likable, or, you know, um, but no, that didn't happen. And when my book was published, it was very well received, and um, I, I was very surprised at that. I don't know why, but um, so it was. I could only, I were talking about. I suppose we're talking about patriarchy, we're talking about mm. this, but it might, I've had a very positive experience. Um, but, and maybe being lucky, you know, my, my book was published, it, it did well, and I didn't get a bad review. So I don't know, um, I'm not sitting here going, it's been dreadfully hard. But I do know very good writers who have been struggling for 10 years and still haven't got published. I do know it can be hard to get that combination. Um, you can have a beautiful book. But, but I think publishers now are looking for something that has this hook and this, you know, mm -hmm. thing. But, but I think Ireland is good to it, its writers in that it, it gives us platforms constantly. Mm -hmm. for, you know, I didn't and good to female writers. Yes, okay. yes, yes. To be fair, better than the, the well, theatre. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, when, when I published, when well, my editor was, was uh, female, my PR was female, um, everyone who rang me and asked me to come and read was female. Um, everyone who came to the events were female. Um, and, you know, so that's there, but you have to see where it's coming from too. It, it, the support was all. Yeah. You know, have, you, have you noticed though? Um, I've noticed that you know at the start I was like, well, every, everyone is female. Like my yeah. editor is female, my agent is female. But the more successful that I got, and the more I was like, oh, you know, the CEO wants to meet you, and the, you know, the president of uh, Quirkus or Hachet wants to meet you and bring you up for dinner. Like, oh, the president of who? Hachet. Yeah. Publishers. Oh yes, publishers. Yeah, sorry. And I was like, oh great. And then they're always men. It's really yeah. interesting. The higher up you get, the ones who are really in the position. Same in television and in politics. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. Now, well, I don't know. Home, their babies. <laughs> I remember the nursing organisation saying to me down and asking me down in Galway um, uh, why the teachers. Uh, have a better, you are better unionized and get better, you know, are, are better heard or the voices are better heard. And I said, that's because most of the politicians are teachers. You have to kind of stand up, you know, I mean, if women, well, it comes to that in a second. But then, let's go back to um, something that you mentioned there. And I know because I know they're in the audience and I can, I, I like to dabble myself sometimes in the odd article, but that's as far as I can go. What makes a good writer? Tell us now what makes a good writer. Um, what do you think? from your experience makes a good writer? What is it about your writing, or what do you do about your writing that you think makes it come alive? Um, I think with mine, I, you know what, I wanted to write for ages, and I think for years, and I kept saying, if I ever write a book, it has to be perfect. It has to be the best book that's ever written, and it has to win you know, all the prizes, because I want that ex-boyfriend of mine to read it, and I never should have broken up with her. <laughs> I may say it now. I want to say it now. I want to say it now. I think that I have to leave go of that idea of perfection and also just not care what anyone else thinks. And I think that was such an obsession with me for years and years and years. And it was such a driving force. It was you know how people perceived me and what people thought of me. And I think when I turned um, 26, I was like, I just don't care anymore. Um, and I think because of that, I could be really honest in both books um, and I think that's what probably that's what people seem to respond to because I get emails every day from people who've read them and they're like you know I think like this too I thought I was the only one um, it was just amazing to read your book and see those thoughts written down on the page and it's made me feel less alone um, and that's I mean that's very humbling it is very humbling and what happens Louise is there another well in there I mean, that is one well that has been, and the writing has allowed you to express that mm -hmm. tragedy and joy of coming through. You know, that experience 
Is there another one? Yeah, of course. I just signed it. There better be. I just signed another two book deal. So, <laughs> so can you give us a heads up on that? Um, yeah, well, I just signed another. Um, these are going to be with the adult list. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. I mean, I tend I when I because I live in Dublin, but when I write, I go home, home to West Cork, um, just because. There is less distractions. Dublin, too many boys and too many cocktails, and that sort of thing. But um, so yeah, I just go home, and I think that's the joy about living um, in Ireland, mm -hmm. which I never appreciated. I hated living in a small town growing up. I felt so self-conscious. I couldn't wait to leave. I couldn't wait to leave Ireland. And then I, when I came home, it just felt like the, this quality of stillness um, and just it's so beautiful here. Like just the, the nature is so beautiful. But I find that every time I do that, I just feel like it, it is. It's like it's filling up a well inside me, and then I can express it mm -hmm. through my mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. And Neil, you're about a good writer. What makes a good writer? What do you think? What is it about you that is a good writer? Well, what do you see as good writing? Or? And what, what, yeah, what, what is this? I mean, it's not never one thing. Yeah. But what do you think those combinations are? Honest you writing. You mentioned that was more the word. Honest writing. Um, but also, I like bad writing too. I like, I like, um, I like. I mean, um, in terms of, I like, I like. I was never going to say it like it's oh, it's fine with bad writing. I don't mean like that, but I, I, like, I read everything. But when, when I, I like plot. I like good story. Mm. You know, um, I don't like books that are consciously trying to be something. Mm. They have this. You can feel it when you know mm. that they're striving towards an, an artificial sense to them that they know what they are you know I, I, it's hard to explain but they're um trying to be a type of book or, uh, you mean honest writing you can see you can you, you feel it I, mean, it's like, I like books that get straight to the core i like um i like writing that's quite sparse mm -hmm. um i don't like too many words <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and so what's I, not said is as important i really as well. think yeah. what's not said is more powerful yeah. when you stop like often when i when i was editing when i when I'm editing work it's I read something and then I'll take out the last line, the bit where I kind of go, uh -huh. do you know? And then, and then it's left because it, writing isn't just, um, you're not writing to the page. Once, once this becomes a book, you're engaging with a reader who you ha assume is as intelligent as you are and you don't need to punch it home. And you leave that, the more you leave, um, the more you engage with the writer or the reader, the more you're given, they can enjoy the book too. And they can create, there's a, there's a, a scene in my book, um, there's a shop in my book, mm. and people, uh, someone, a couple of people said to me, oh, I could really see the shop. And they described, Ullen shop. Hmm? Ullen shop. Carmen yes, shop. Yeah, Carmen shop. And um, I didn't describe the, the shop. I, you know, yeah. I described the paint, where I, I didn't describe it at all. But what they said was what I <coughs> had in my head, but everyone had a different, mm -hmm. and it's like Heathcliff, you know, if we, mm -hmm. he knew what Heathcliff looked like, we would not fancy him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. You have to leave that, yeah. that bit of a gap, I think, yeah. so, but, yeah. you know, it's, 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 uh, it's very hard to define what good writing is, you know, and, mm -hmm. but I think you have to be trying. Well, I think you make a very good point, just to be honest, you know, that either yes. are dry or artificial or try yeah. too hard, or you know there's another agenda, yeah. hidden agenda, or something else, some come or something that's not from their heart, that yeah. it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't find its way to you the same way. Yeah. I had a, I, I, I'm reading to a reading I wanted to do now, I had four aunts, five aunts, in fact, who lived up the town in Foxford, and they were known as the Dollies. They were my granddads, but I thought they were aunts at the time, because we didn't kind of make the distinction. And they had been away um, in America as governesses, and they came back to Foxford in oh, the 50s, late 50s, um, and they became double exiles because they were exiled out of the, you know, when they were 19 or 20, and then they came back and they lived at the top of the town. And they did all the trackeries of being in America and working as in, in Jewish houses, and, and they were great at sewing and making cakes. And, but they never had any affection and they never really had the arms around them because they never they never had the facility to marry. I think there's a novel in it, but I don't have the ability to write it. But I think in fact um, the, the playwright did it, um, Free, uh, Dancing with Lunacy, in another way he did it. Uh, but they were called the Dollies because they used to wear lip paint, as the fellas said. The Dollies are uptown with hip paint, <laughs> and lipstick, and they were always seen walking to mask. And I read your poem, her poem, Kitty. Oh, yeah. And I'd like you to read it for the audience now, to satisfy me. Right. Uh, no, no, but I think it's a beautiful evocation 
of an ant. It's a maiden ant or an ant. Right. I don't want to presuppose yeah. what anybody yeah. else's imagination. Yeah. So you might you might I mean, it does. It's, it's um it's most of my work is is um is in You could stand uh, yeah. so that everybody could Okay. Right. So most of my work, my poetry isn't particularly personal or my novels aren't. But um this one was written about an aunt of mine who died when when, uh, when I was a teenager, and uh, so it's called Kitty. We were the same height before you died, me 15 to your 65. It was April and it snowed. A stroke sent you to Nice Hospital. Take your time, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> take your time. The last time I would see you alive. You, lover only of austerity and Christ, that nurse tied a blue ribbon to your graying hair lost your glasses. As I left, she lifted your wrist to orchestrate a wave, ordered in her sharp voice, say goodbye now, say goodbye. <laughs> Unseen, you tried on a smile. Once the center of my world, you are now close to forgotten. And like the prayers you used to say for the soul nearest release, I pray for a glimpse of you, I the atheist, for you are at the edge of memory, somewhere no one wants to be about to disappear on me. I strain to recall your voice, hear nothing but the kettle rattling to a steam, children playing outside. See your hand buttering a thick slab of bread and jam for Corrine. I see those hands reach out, beak-like, closed over something, something I'm trying to give back. Go on, take it. The treasures in your heavy dresser, handkerchiefs, doilies, the kinds of things gifted to a maiden aunt. A bottle of Chaparelli, shocking pink. Can I have that? Of course you can. It never opened. I conjure up a scent of faded bergamot from the neck of that tiny flask of locked glass. <coughs> and the things you'd say, all the nevers. Never speak ill of a nun or a priest. Never write anything down. Never do anything you wouldn't like your mother to see you do. <laughs> like what? I'd ask. Cheeky already. Like what? Stop. You'll be struck dead. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you and I should have gotten on at all, but we did. What do I really know of you? Your love. And the brief details a child can hold. Aunt. Seamstress. The word singer stretched in gold on the belly of the insect-shaped machine that wore down your sight. Once you were hoped to be a nun, your sister would try, throw her eyes up to heaven, that one up there, praying again. I often saw you, lips in silent movement to the sacred heart, your sore knees on the carpet. You whipped sweets from your crossover apron like a grand aunt magician. I saw some of the same as yours. Navy with cherry and red <coughs> flowers being sold in a Galway department store. A pattern I'd often laid my cheek on when I was sorry for being bold. The shop fabric felt crisp to the touch. Nowhere near the homespun softness you wore day in, day out, year in, year out. So I will hold you instead, here. Your hair pinned at the temples, coiled into flat spirals, <coughs> gentle kiss curls awaiting release. Hold you as you were when you were not yet stooped. Forever taller than me. to ask you. She didn't know I was going to ask her to do that. It's a beautiful poem. Beautiful poem. And I think it actually brings up the truth in writing. The actual truth in writing. Now, you're going to read, you're going to, to read something, aren't you? Am I? No, I, I, yes, I do, please. Only one piece. No, have you got a second piece? Well, I, well, I, I can find one. Well, <laughs> while you're doing that, while you're doing that, Aunt obviously had a huge influence on you, didn't she? She did, but it's like, um, in did a, you, you didn't know it at the time? No, no. But, um, you know, I was the first grandchild, you know, and I, it didn't remain the case, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only, well, I was the only for, for a long time, but 
So she was kind of, oh, we don't need to be having these conversations with our children. And I'm like, well, actually, if you look at the statistics coming out of the Rape Crisis Centre, we do need to be having these conversations at, as young as possible so that they understand what consent means. Well, anyway, I was a little bit upset. But my editor, Ryan, she said, you can't buy this sort of publicity. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> will you read something? Will you just yeah. a short passage? Yeah. <laughs> this is um, the book is um, in two parts, so it's before the rape and after the rape. Um, so this is afterwards, and it's just really about the the impact of the incident on Emma's family. Brian walks into the kitchen area. Neither he nor our father is saying anything when he returns with a plate of shepherd's pie. The scrape of a knife on my father's plate, shallow breathing and waving a hand in front of his face when he realises how hot the food is, gulping down water to cool his mouth. We eat in silence. I wonder if it will always be like this. Will it just be me, my mother and my father, eating our dinner every night at the same time? Shepherd's pie on a Monday, bacon and cabbage on a Tuesday, lasagna on a Wednesday, stir fry on a Thursday, salmon and broccoli bake on a Friday, quiche and salads from the organic kitchen project on a Saturday, the roast dinner on a Sunday. Brian would come home every weekend for a while, pulling me onto the sofa on a Friday night to watch the Late Late Show or a movie with him, asking me how my week went. Did I have any plans for Saturday? Had I given any more thought to my leaving cert? or college, or an evening class, or an online course, or some other idea he would come up with to try and force me to leave the house and be normal. But he would start to dread it. He would start to hate opening the door into this house full of ghosts. There would be one weekend missed, then another. He would start to come home once a month, then for birthdays and bank holidays, then maybe just for Christmas and Easter. He would move away to Canada or Australia or Japan, somewhere far enough that he wouldn't feel guilty about not visiting more often. There would be emails, promises to Skype, packages arriving in the post full of expensive, useless items that he saw and thought of me. Then he would meet someone, someone who laughed a lot, and her family would be close and loving and they would welcome him as if he was one of their own. He would bring her home to meet us, and her eyes would be wary, and she would speak to me in gentle, low tones. They would have children, and then they would visit less often. Children are so sensitive to energy, they would tell each other. We don't want them to absorb the negativity in that house. And he would tell himself not to blame me, my fault. He would tell himself to wish that he had a different sister. More emails, more phone calls, more Christmases spent with her family, while my parents and I ate Brussels sprouts and stuffings in front of the television, numbing ourselves on carbohydrates and reruns of class classic movies. I would look at my mother and my father and marvel at how old they had become, how they had turned 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, and I hadn't even noticed. And then I would realize that I was old too, my bones starting to creak as my skin sagged around them. I would lie awake in the same single bed that I had slept in since I was a child, staring at a blank ceiling, wondering where the stars had gone. Well, I think uh, the strength in that book is the before and the after, and the devastation, the complete desert, and the silence mm. that you evoke so brilliantly. Uh, you do it as well, but, I mean, in another way. And what comes through, really, the talent and the honesty of your writing, from, as I say, as I said earlier, from different wells. Before I open it up to the audience, I just want to ask some general questions, since I'm sitting up there in the Senate and um, up in the Great Leinster House. What do you think of uh, gender quotas now? Two 